when I was growing up, one of the most important people in my life was my cousin Jim. He was just that much older than me that, you know, everything he did I thought was just amazing and, and, and perfect. Uh, we, we, we had so many exciting times together. We used to hunt together and fish together and, and boat together and swim and, and just do all kinds of, uh, of things young guys do growing up. Uh, what I didn't know about Jim at the time is that he was an alcoholic. Uh, that began to show up in his life when we were, we were late in our teenage years. Uh, Jim started to drink a lot and to, to get in trouble with the law. And in fact, eventually, he was arrested and convicted of manslaughter uh, because of, a, of an accident that happened while he was drunk. That started a pattern in Jim's life. He would, he would go to jail, he would be in jail, he would come out, he would go through some sort of rehab, and, and all of us in the family, everybody who loved him would think that, okay, this is it, this time it's gonna work. Uh, this time Jim's life is gonna, is gonna take off and, and he's gonna be that, potential, that, that, that person filled with potential that we all know and believe he can be. But every time it ended in disappointment. Uh, the, the alcoholism would catch him and, and pretty soon he'd be in trouble with the law and back in jail. And that pattern continued for years until one year he was, he was in jail in Texas and, uh, and, and most of the family were, were no longer in contact with him. I probably was the only one that was still in contact with him. There was a Methodist church in North Texas, a little country church with just a small group of people, but they felt their calling was to minister in the prison. And so they would go to his prison and they would lead disciple Bible study. That's a very powerful Bible study the Methodist church has developed. And for the first time in his life, Jim, Jim began to really respond to that because disciple Bible study is, is not just informational. It's not just about God, but it's relational. It's about how you connect with the other Christians in your small group. Jim couldn't believe the way these little older folks from this little country church came in and treated him and the other prisoners just like regular people. He also couldn't believe the way that that the other prisoners started to treat each other in the group. He said they became like brothers. It was a transforming moment in Jim's life to be a part of that small group, learning to be followers of Jesus Christ. Now, the one thing Jim couldn't do is he, is he couldn't give his heart completely to Jesus because he felt unworthy. He felt like the things that happened in his life uh, made it, impossible for Jesus to, to completely love him. He, he got out of prison and, and he went to that little Methodist church that administered to him. And he went to Sunday school on Sunday mornings before worship. Everybody there was 30 years, 25 years older than him. But that, that small group experience was so powerful, it became transformative in his life. He joined an AA group and, and the AA group uh, saved his life. Being a part of that, uh, there were people in the AA group that he couldn't lie to. He, he couldn't pretend things were different than they really were. They nailed him, they pinned him down, they, they, they held him accountable. Meanwhile, his, his small group, his Sunday school class, was affirming him and encouraging him. Then one day Jim called me and he said he had become a Christian. And I asked him what had happened. He said he was in church on Sunday morning and and it was that time of year when the church asked for pledges. And he said, I suddenly realized that, that I had this second chance at life. And it was all because of the grace of God. It wasn't because of anything I had done or anything I had earned. And I wanted to somehow take what I had received and share it with other people. And I wanted to do that in a free way. I, I wanted to do that in a way that was that showed absolute trust in Jesus. He said, so I, I sat down and for the first time in my life, I filled out a pledge card. He said, I can't tell you how funny that was. I was an ex-con, alcoholic, without a job. And I filled out a pledge card. I put my faith in Jesus, threw myself in his arms, and I, and I said, Jesus, there's no way I can do this. I'm absolutely and totally dependent on you to make this pledge, this promise, come true. Jim's life changed that day. He stepped into discipleship. He became accountable. 
He became committed. He became generous and a giver. He took what he had received and he passed it on. Now, a couple of decades later, Jim's never had another drink. He's never been in trouble ever again. He's been leading the life of a faithful Christian because of his Sunday school class, because of his Bible study, because of his AA group, and because he took what he experienced there and let it become real in his life. At the end of the month, on the last Sunday of the month, we, we ask you to fill out a pledge card. It's, it's not because we're trying to make the church budget. God will work that out. It's, it's because that is a crucial part of being a disciple of Jesus Christ. It's a way of saying that I believe that I can join my resources, my gifts, my, what I have with these other Christians sitting right here with me in worship today and in Sunday school and Bible study with me. And together, somehow miraculously, Jesus can do something with all of this that's, that's beyond our understanding. It's one of the greatest moments in a Christian's life to be able to step up, sign that card, and say, Jesus, I'm just going to fall into your arms and trust you to bring the very best outcome out of this. Nobody does that accidentally. We do that because we learn, we love, we have support, and we have the great gift of being able to do it together. But that whole concept, of course, comes from the Bible. You think about the day of Pentecost when, when Peter preached and hundreds of people became Christians. There's, it's, it's so exciting, so dramatic, tongues of fire, people hearing the gospel in their own language, no matter what part of the world they were from. And sometimes we miss the end of the story of the day of Pentecost. When you get to the end of the story, the story is about people who, who then get together in small groups. The Bible says they came together, they, they shared meals together, they studied the scripture together, and they gave what they had and they shared their money with each other and with everyone who had a need. That's what intentional discipleship is. That's, that's what it's all about. It's, it's about gathering together in, in a group with other Christians allowing them to, to hold you accountable and, 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 and allowing them to, to help you shape your spiritual life. It's so powerful. I can't even imagine being a, a parent without being a part of a small group like a Sunday school class. That, that's impossible for me to conceive of. It, it's so challenging to raise children in this culture. To raise Christian children, I, I need help. I, I need to sit with other Christians other Christian parents and hear how they're doing it, how they're making it, and be able to share my struggles and ask for prayer. Uh, another element of, of that whole thing of being a part of those small groups, it's so incredibly powerful. I, I literally can't put it into words for you probably, but you know, we have Sunday school classes in our church that have been together for decades. For decades, these people have come together and shared their lives. No matter what happened in work, no matter what happened in their, in their social life, no matter what was happening with their family and their children, they knew that every Sunday they could come back together, be in that group, be encouraged, affirmed, loved, and cared for. One of the most amazing experiences I have as a pastor is when I do a funeral for someone. And their children will say, well, you know, she was a member of this class at Centenary. For 20 years, 25 years, 30 years, and that was the source of her spiritual strength. Jesus knew that. That was incredibly important to him. We have hundreds of stories or hundreds of examples of Jesus going to the synagogue to be with a small group and study. In fact, sometimes as modern Christians, we read the Bible and we, we sort of misinterpret what Jesus is doing. We, we talk about Jesus as a preacher, when in fact he only preached two or three times. What we think of as real open preaching to large groups, the Sermon on the Mount, a couple of times in the temple, a couple of times in public maybe. In fact, most of the time, the, the stories we hear about Jesus and the things that he's saying and the things that he's teaching happen in small groups. He was a small group leader. Jesus knew and believed and understood that, that when we come together in small groups as believers, we gather strength there together. By sharing our stories together, we gather strength. By praying for one another, we gather strength. 
Jesus did that in the synagogue. As modern Christians, when we hear the word synagogue, we, we just think it's like a Jewish church. But that's not what it was in Jesus' time. In Jesus' time, it was quite different. The, the place where you went to worship was the temple. That was the big place where thousands of people came to worship. But scattered throughout the little villages uh, of Israel and, and on into Asia Minor, what we call Turkey and Greece, and even as far as Rome, there were, there were groups uh, of Jews who would come together in these little groups and meet in, in little buildings called synagogues. The synagogue was a meeting house. It was a community center. It's where they had their potlucks. It's where they celebrated a newborn baby. It's, it's where they gathered to grieve the loss of a husband or a wife. And especially it's where they came in small groups to study the scripture and learn how to apply the Bible to their lives. If you look at the most important stories in Jesus' life, the ones that that we would maybe say make the greatest impact on us as Christians, 10 of those stories, the majority of those stories, happen in the synagogue. Now it happens in, in places like Magdala, where we, we take pilgrims. We went on our last trip from Centenary. We went to Magdala, which was an amazing experience. It's a synagogue where, where Jesus preached and taught. It, it, was just, it, was, it was covered by the Romans soon after Jesus' life. The Romans came through there to punish the Jews. They, they buried the city of Magdala, Mary Magdalene, Magdala. They buried that city and buried that synagogue. It was only in about 2005, it was rediscovered and, and, and the dirt and, and rubble was cleared away. And there was the synagogue where Jesus gathered to pray, to study with his fellow believers. You can, you can lay your hand down on the stone where Jesus knelt to pray. You can sit in the seat where Jesus sat to learn and to teach. And you realize what an incredibly important part of his life that was. Of course, the greatest example of that comes from the scripture reading we have for today, and that's the synagogue in Capernaum. That was really Jesus' spiritual home. The years of his ministry that we read about, when he told the great stories, when he, when he healed the sick, um, when, when, he, when he ministered to people, all happened in that Galilee area. And week after week after week, he returned to Capernaum. It's an exciting experience as a Christian to walk into that, that synagogue. The foundation is still there from the time of Jesus. And know that that's, that's where Jesus found his spiritual home. That's where he met with a few fellow believers to study the scripture. It was the spiritual home of Peter, James, and John, the fishermen. The spiritual home of Matthew. They would have been bar mitzvahed there. They would have been brought into the faith there, like one of our confirmation classes. People would have watched them grow up. People would, would gather around them, older men and women, and place a hand on their shoulders and pray for God's spirit to guide them as they began the, the journey of being followers of Jesus. The synagogue there is full of stories in Jesus' life. A few feet just from the synagogue, Simon Peter's mother-in-law had a home, and, and it was really a second home for Jesus. It's, it's where he went to rest and recuperate, right there where he could look into, it looked right into the front door of the synagogue. He was there, he healed Simon Peter's mother and saved her life. It was only about six feet from there that the, the Sea of Galilee touches the beach. It would be there after the resurrection that Jesus would pass through the gates of the synagogue, gather his disciples there on the shore, and forgive St. Peter for denying him. Through it all, everything was centered in the synagogue, in the small group gathering of believers coming and loving and supporting one another. Jesus taught there, he received teaching there, he prayed there, and he was prayed for there. It also became a place where, where believers would gather and, and share what they had with others. In fact, by the time the Apostle Paul is on the scene, he, he will go from synagogue to synagogue to synagogue. It's really the, the New Testament story in Paul's life. The synagogues had started to follow Jesus, and, and, and the people there had started to become followers of Christ. And he would go to those synagogues, meet and teach with the people, each of these small groups, receive an offering. They would share what they had 
so that Paul could then take that money and, and help the poor. We do the same thing in the Methodist church. Every Methodist church contributes and, and we put a portion of what we give together so that we can go out and change the lives of people in need throughout the world. That all grew out of that, that sense of being Christian together, being people of faith together and sharing our faith together. Now, one of the greatest gifts you have as a Christian is to be able to take what you've received from Christ and to share it with other people. One of the most beautiful things you can ever do, uh, something that, that will truly bless Jesus Christ, is to invite someone to join you in your small group, your Sunday school, your Bible study, your, your prayer group, to say to that person, come join us and let's make this spiritual journey together. I want to close today by by sharing with you an example of how powerful that can be. I was serving in a church and, and uh, it was an active, fun, growing church, but, but there were a group of, of several young couples who had wanted to have children and had been unable. So we brought them together in a group on Sunday nights and, and we began to, to study a curriculum on prayer and, and just praying that, that God would open doors in their life. One of the young couples brought brought another young couple who were in the same situation. They weren't members of the church. They didn't come on Sunday morning. They just brought them to the small group, Jim and Victoria. And you could, you could tell when Jim and Victoria came in that they weren't regular church people. They were very uncomfortable. They were very unsure. They were very guarded and defensive. But they were also desperate. They were searching for help anywhere they could find it. Over the next few weeks, they, they became a part of this group and they experienced I incredible grace, acceptance, love, and support. We prayed for each other. We, we, we got to a point in the study and, and, and as a group where we, we asked God to just release us from our preconceptions of what a family might be. In other words, to allow God to create for these couples a, a family according to His plan. That might mean through the birth of a child, that might mean through adoption, fostering a child, or, or working as a volunteer, whatever that might be. We, we wanted to be open. Every couple wanted to be open and allow God to, to take charge of that in their life. It was a powerful and an incredible evening to see these young couples make that decision to let go of their control and their plan for their life and invite Christ to open a door wherever it might lead. They all made that commitment except for Jim and Victoria. And as Jim and Victoria talked about it, the reason they couldn't make that commitment became apparent. They were from rural Mississippi, and we're talking about the 80s now, and they were afraid that if they adopted, they might have to, or at least be asked to, adopt a child that wasn't white. And that was impossible for them. I can remember the room being very quiet as they shared their story. And I thought as the pastor and the leader of the group, I ought to say something, but, but I couldn't find anything to say. And then members of the group just came forward and hugged them and put their arms around them and said, it's okay. You just be honest with Christ. That's all you have to be. And we'll love and support you just as you are. It was an experience I think they probably had never had before in their life. To be able to openly reveal the struggle in their hearts and not be judged about that, but be affirmed and loved. We continued the study, and, and one night we did a powerful exercise. <clears throat> I invited the couples to imagine they were at Capernaum there at the synagogue, and they were in the crowd, and Jesus was teaching. And at the end of his teaching, they would each take turns and go up and meet Jesus. And afterwards, we would talk about what Jesus might have said to them as a couple. And I remember Jim and Victoria being in tears. And when it came their turn to share, Victoria said, I walked up to Jesus in the synagogue. And he had a beautiful baby for me. And he was trying to hand me the baby. 
and I refused to take it. Once again, the room was very quiet. And then a young mother who had lost a child, who wanted another one, was, was in such pain herself, prayed for Victoria. The most powerful, grace-filled prayer I've ever heard. That Jesus would simply wrap his arms around her. And when you're in a group like that, it can be life-changing and transforming. There are times in our life when we don't have the faith to do what we want to do or what we're called to do. And the power of being in that kind of a group is we get to borrow the faith of the people around us when we need it. Four and a half months later, we stood at the altar of that church. That small group surrounding Jim and Victoria as we baptized Jim and Victoria's adopted daughter, a beautiful Filipino baby. Faith is a challenge in this culture. There are things that, that we can't imagine as possible in our lives, no matter how much we want to trust Jesus. No one can do it alone. God created us to do it together. The Word of God in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit.